We're very lucky to have Pamela Newkirk with us tonight. Uh, she's currently at New York University as professor of journalism, and she comes to that job with an impressive resume in her chosen field, uh, with honors including an international reporting award from the New York Association of Black Journalists uh, for a series that provided on-the-ground coverage of Nelson Mandela's release from prison in South Africa, uh, not to mention a Pulitzer Prize for Spot News in 1992 as part of a team at New York Newsday. Uh, beyond that, she's contributed to a broad range of news organizations such as the Washington Post, the Columbia Journalism Review, The Nation, Essence, and Art News. Uh, and she's even formerly served here in D.C. as a Capitol Hill correspondent for Gannett News Service. And beyond that, she's also behind four books, uh, the most recent of which we'll be hearing more about soon. But as to the others, she has edited the collection Letters from Black America, which includes centuries of African-American written correspondence from household name figures and otherwise. And she's authored two prior titles. First from 2000, there was Within the Veil, Black Journalists, White Media, which won the National Press Club Award for Media Criticism. And then from 2015, Spectacle, The Astonishing Life of Odo Benga, which was the winner of an NAACP Image Award, and copies of that one you can find in store as well at our register. Uh, now she's here for her latest book entitled Diversity Incorporated, The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business. For decades, promises of increasing diversity have been integral to the internal and external branding of innumerable institutions in this country. Uh, across the corporate sphere, in the entertainment industry, and throughout all levels of education, uh, with the goal to better reflect the country's demographics and thus shift the expectations and opportunities for underserved communities. These initiatives, as Newkirk shows, may have provided success in some cases, but on the whole, uh, results have largely fallen short of the touted hopes, leaving many behind while seeming to sweep any uncomfortable to mention racist attitudes and practices under the rug. And to draw out the discussion around this book and the many questions it raises, we're thrilled to have her here with one of the best interviewers around, Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post, who works there as an opinion writer and as a member of the paper's editorial board and as the host of the Cape Up podcast. So with that, please join me in welcoming them both to Politics and Prose. Hi everyone! Thanks for for coming, and I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna be doing a lot of juggling. I think we'll both be doing a lot of yeah, juggling because yeah, yeah. I've got my iPad and yeah, I've got yeah, your yeah. book, <laughs> and um, there's so much in this book. If you have not, if you have not read it yet, well, actually, a show of hands. How many of you have already read White Fragility? Okay. How many of you have already read White Rage? Okay. So. If you've read both of those books, then Pamela Newkirk's book, Diversity, Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, is going to be another puzzle piece in these two books, um, in actually this, this genre, which is very, very important. The first time I ever heard, Pamela, that diversity training was actually detrimental, was not was not achieving the goal that it set out to was when I interviewed um, another journalist who wrote a book about women in the workplace, whose name is escaping me right now. I interviewed her for my podcast. And I was just very surprised by what she was telling me that diversity training was actually harming women <laughs> in the workplace. Right. And now here comes your book that also says, that, yeah, diversity training is harming people of color, African Americans in particular, in the workplace. Why is such a failed business a billion-dollar business in the United States? <laughs> well, that was the question that prompted my, my journey um, to, to uh, try to figure out why are companies spending billions of dollars of something that clearly has not moved the needle nearly enough over the past five decades? Uh, we had seen tremendous progress uh, in the 1970s. And um, much of that progress was either stalled or was erased um, during the Reagan administration. And then there's been a steady uh, dismantlement of many of the measures that had borne fruit, uh, uh, that had begun to close 
the economic and educational gaps, uh, particularly between blacks and, and whites. And then, you know, things just kind of stopped. And yet we had this delusion around being this post-race society as the dismantlement of measures continued, you know, whether it's Voting Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, or, you know, just, you know, uh, policies to to uh, increase diversity in universities, everything was under attack. And so here we are with numbers that are certainly bleak, and I don't think there's a full acknowledgement of what has happened over the past few decades that has resulted in numbers that look, you know, in tech, blacks are like two to three percent. Um, and, uh, you know, you pick a field, mm -hmm. pick any influential field, an our field in journalism. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, diversity has been a preoccupation of our industry for decades. And yet the numbers for African-Americans, for Latinos, for Asians are still really, really low. And so, but yet, companies are investing billions of dollars every year, largely f to pay for measures that have been proven to fail. Well, is that our business is paying for this because what they really want to do, and I'm trying to find, because I've taken, if you've seen me do these interviews before, you know I've got the book and I've got the page numbers and, <laughs> and all of that, um, and I can't find the page number for this where you either quoting someone or you state flat out that businesses, yeah, they'll do the diversity training, but it's not to actually get anything done. It is to check the box. It's to show that they're just trying to do something without actually doing something. Right, and here I will recognize Cyrus Mary, who I had the honor of um, spending a lot of time with researching this book. And um, Cyrus litigated a number of landmark discrimination lawsuits, oh, including him. yeah, that's that's you're, uh, you're, yeah, <laughs> that's the man Wait, um, Coca -Cola. against Coca Cola, Coca -Cola. Texaco. Um, he he is responsible for the NFL's Rooney Rule, along with Johnny Cochran. So anyway, it's Cyrus who I quote, who called many of the efforts by companies drive by diversity. Yes, that yeah. was it. drive drive by diversity. <laughs> drive by. So he, you know, what he said is, is um, you know, that everyone wants to do the climate surveys and the, you know, whatever, but they don't want to do the interventions, and. Um, that's, that's what we see. We see companies doing the exact same thing year after year, having disappointing results. Rents repeat. They do it again. When you say the interventions, what are the interventions that they should be doing? Well, the, the case study that, that I cite um, in one chapter is Coca-Cola. What happened after the settlement of that discrimination lawsuit, they actually looked at the metrics across the company, everything that involved an employee from who was being interviewed for a job, who was being promoted, who who was getting bonuses. They looked at everything and they and they they looked at it across racial and gender lines and they were able to both detect and disrupt patterns of bias, patterns of inequities, which had re, which had prompted the lawsuit to begin with. And over a period of five years, they were able to close those those gaps. So, I mean, it required intention. It required, um, you know, vigilance. But but it shows that with that kind of intention, you you can act and commitment, you can mm -hmm. actually do it. And that gets to something else that you write about towards the end of the book, and that is the whole uh, when people are when companies are challenged about the fact that they don't have a representative representative um, workforce. The, the the response is always, but you know the pipeline. Right. There isn't a pipeline. Right. Um, for us to to hire. Right. And there have been so many studies that have conclusively showed shown that the pipeline is no longer the issue. That's the issue that was cited in the 1960s when 
many of the professions that had long been closed off to African Americans and other people of color, the doors finally were pried open. And then people say, yeah, but the pipeline. And then all of these training programs were created. And even journalists who had worked in, you know, black media, who were highly trained, who were well-educated, even they were put through training programs to before they could take a job, an entry-level job at you know, a mainstream newspaper. So the pipeline issue has been with us for 50 years and counting, and yet you can see just legions of African Americans, Latinos, and others graduating from many of the the most prestigious schools in this country who were not being hired at the same rate to to work in in these professions Mm -hmm. in which they are acutely underrepresented. Um, one of the things that happened, as you were talking about the sort of attacks on advancement, particularly during the Reagan administration, but there are also, you write about this, but also in, in White Rage, Carol Anderson the writes backlash. about mm-hmm. the backlash via the Supreme Court Precisely. on affirmative action, mm-hmm. all of the cases that chipped away at uh, affirmative action. And you have a, a quote from Lee Bollinger, president of Columbia University, on page 132. Um, <laughs> Where he, um, you write, Bollinger concedes that fear of lawsuits has caused university leaders to shy away from placing diversity in the context of justice. And you quote him as saying, I would urge everyone to say it because it needs to be said. I think we've allowed this loss of memory to take hold and the people who oppose it to set the agenda. And he goes on to say, if anything, the trend is moving toward a flattened diversity for all mantle that embraces diversity of all kinds while ignoring the history and legacy of structural racial disadvantage baked into the educational system. Now, he's talking about the educational system, but just take out educational Preci- system precisely. and add in anything else. And this is, a, this is a blanket warning. Right, right. And, I mean, he's been at the forefront of this movement since he was president of the University of Michigan, where he was named in two lawsuits claiming reverse discrimination by white students who who uh, were denied admission. Well, those two two of those cases went to the Supreme Court. Both right? of those Both cases of went yeah. to the Supreme Court, and it was like a split decision. In in one case, um, they upheld um, diversity as a compelling um, interest for for schools, and uh, and the and the other, um, you know, they basically um, kind of wiped out race as mm-hmm. as as. A, one of the tools you could use Mm -hmm. for admissions, yeah. Um, I bring that up because you write about, in addition to Coca-Cola and Texaco, um, and you write about them at at length. You go into the ins and outs of these cases that were involved. But then there's the the case of the the person at Apple. Ah. who was she the, the our sister? Yes, you mean the, the African American woman, right? Who, who was the, the chief diversity officer, right? And what did she say? Tell everyone what she said. At and this and event. I've heard this before, so she's not the first one I've heard describe <laughs> diversity. She pretty much said that she gets annoyed when um, people attach diversity to like blacks and Latinos. Diversity can be a white man with blue eyes. Diversity could be, and on and on. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and what happened to her? Yeah. <laughs> and, and what she ended up she did she her? didn't last. She she, she was did. there for less than a less, less than, than a year, year. and she yeah. was gone not much longer right. after after that event. Right. Um. So <laughs> we've <laughs> we've been talking at 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 the thirty five thousand foot level about about this, but what is terrific about your book is don't be lulled into thinking that this is just a book about business and business being bad at diversity. You you dive in in the way that both Carol Anderson does in White Rage and Robin DiAngelo does in White Fragility in talking about the underlying reasons why diversity trainings don't work. And right. it's because there are a lot of blind spots. And you write um, on page 85. <laughs> Um, and it gets to this this notion of the different ways African Americans and whites view race. Right. And you write 
Um, it no longer, let's see, moreover, he revealed um, the blind spot that many whites, left and right, have when it comes to the ways of 21st century bias. It no longer requires the horse, tear gas, and dogs weaponized in Bull Connor's day. Videotaped scenes of brutalized civil rights protesters have been replaced by images of fleeing or handcuffed blacks being shot or choked by police, often with impunity, along with the racial profiling and mass incarceration of black and brown men. Um, while racial customs and decorum in public settings have radically changed, the deep-seated prejudices many whites hold of black and brown people have apparently not. And you go on to, to give examples, but there's another part in here where you talk about how whites view racism as discrete individual, <clears throat> excuse me, discrete individual actions, whereas people of color, African Americans in particular, view race and racism as a structure, as a system Precisely. that we have to navigate and push back against. Right. Um, I was going to say on a daily basis, but it's probably hourly. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say. So di so dive into that more. Why was it important for well, you to Yeah, because I think to, to just talk about what institutions are doing to diversify without talking about the social context in which they're attempting to do this, it's it's it makes the whole thing so abstract, right? Um, but you have to understand the social context of uh, you know, Jonathan getting up in the morning and going to work and and then what happens like all of those you know you have to connect the dots mm -hmm. so things like and, and this is sounding abstract because that's why it's a book and not an article because there's so much context that's needed to even have this discussion but you know we have to look at media portrayals we have to look at school curricula we have to look at there are so many ways in which white America in particular, but others as well, understand African Americans or think they understand African Americans. And until you really have that wraparound view of what actually is going on, it these diversity efforts, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you have to understand that we're still up against these demeaning images of African Americans that were created, codified, legitimized by all of our major institutions, from higher ed to elementary school to museums, literature. Like, if you don't understand the ways in which African Americans have been demonized in this country, then you don't understand what we're talking about when we say Black Lives Matter. You don't understand, um, you know, why these diversity initiatives don't work. Mm -hmm. You have to like really have a sense of what it is that we're actually experiencing. Um, you have a, a quote in here from uh, British director Sagay, uh, his first name Michonne is Sag Michonne Sagay, Sagay mm -hmm. uh, British filmmaker, where he, you quote him as saying, people want diversity as long as they don't have to do it. Yeah. A lot of the times they want our physical presence, but not our voice. And I... I underlined it, I asterisked, <laughs> I underlined the asterisk, yeah. because, I mean, I related to that, because I can't tell you how many times. Oh, especially in the newsroom. In, in, oh. in, in, in my profession, <laughs> oh, when, yeah. you know, it's the presence, great, glad you're here, but the right. moment you open your mouth. Right, there's pushback. There, there, if there's pushback, there might be little twitches. Yeah. <laughs> Discomfort. You know, please hurry up. Finished, finished talking, right. that kind of thing. But how do you, that gets to the larger issue of back to diversity training. So you have these companies doing this training that they don't want to do, right. that is box checking, right. and you have employees, let's say this was a diversity training going on right now, where the white people in the audience, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm overly generalizing, I, I know that, where the white people might be annoyed about the fact that, well, why do I, why do I have to do this? Right. But then you have the African Americans, people of color, in people of color, African Americans in particular, who are uncomfortable it, and might not feel um, empowered right. or just, or comfortable because of their livelihood 
saying to a fellow coworker, Precisely. Hey, here's this thing that you did or you said right. that um, was problematic. Yeah, it's problematic. <laughs> <laughs> and and, it, and it, it also assumes that you can train people in a few hours to undo centuries worth of damage that's been done. It assumes that, first of all, where is that curriculum that can actually make a difference in the way people feel is about there, each other? Is there one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see it. I was going to say, I mean, if there was one, it would, yeah, it like would a, be in here. An effective <laughs> one. But, um, but what those training sessions have been found to do is trigger a backlash and resentment, particularly um, by white men. And um, it's not helpful. And, and, and some studies have shown that the percentage of black women in particular go down after you have these diversity training sessions, probably because of all of the tension that, that they create. I mean, just by the argument you just made, I mean... I if the paper, if the Washington Post were to say you have to go to diversity training, oh my training, god, like, <laughs> I'm sick that no, day. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm I'm out. I have to be in New York. Right. Um, <laughs> not that that's going to be any better, because then that's the other job. That's the MSNBC job. Which, right. I mean, as you 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 write about Hollywood, you write about academia, you write about business, you write about journalism. How all of these institutions, as you were saying before. Um, don't get it right. right, and don't either don't realize they're not getting it right, or well, don't care that they're not getting it right. Maybe, yeah. Why did you say well? Well, I don't think like I don't think they're at this point. They don't realize that they're not getting it right, unless they're really in denial about the state of race in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like serious denial. Well, I mean, there's one realizing you're not getting it right, and then you bring in the diversity trainer, right. and then you're wondering it's what, what to what, do. Right. Right. It's the, right. what comes next. Right. It, it's what to do. Uh, you know, the good news in this book, and there is good news, people, is that there are models. There are successful models, um, partly due to one of the people, a few of the people in this room. Um, to, oh, there's three of the, Oh, I never met you in person, but I interviewed him. He was the global chief diversity officer at Coca-Cola. Oh, you're that guy. He's that guy who over, Steve Bucarati, who oversaw the transformation of the workplace. Um, and I mean, he had, he had just wonderful um, anecdotes and, you know, descriptions. He, he said something like, you know, in doing these interventions in real time, he wanted to do... Um, Oh, God. He didn't want to do forensics. He wanted to do triage, which is like to actually work on it before the body is dead. <laughs> and, 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 and it was just an amazing thing. Pam Kukos, who also works with Cyrus, I mean, they helped create models that have been proven to work. Triage. Triage. But it also requi it requires, <laughs> as you were saying before, it requires vigilance and intentionality. Oh, commitment. <clears throat> you are have there, to be serious about this. But are there enough people serious? Well, we haven't seen evidence of that. No, we haven't seen evidence of that, but maybe it's because they don't know. And if they see w what they can do differently, um, I, I quoted Pam uh, saying at one point, people are really committed to the way they do things, even if it doesn't like. You know, mm -hmm. if it's not successful, they just keep doing that thing, um, and and it's and and they think it's part of the intentional discrimination. Like if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results, either you're crazy, <laughs> or maybe you really don't want results because you know that this doesn't work. So just keep doing it so it doesn't work. work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there's something you were saying. It just, I feel like Rick Perry right now. The, the idea that I <laughs> no, had in my no, head. No, 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 no. <laughs> not, e not even close. Now, but no. I, the, the, the <laughs> question I was going to ask you about um, intentionality and and vigilance. But 
I'll leave that. If it jumps, if it comes okay. back, I'll You'll jump just, back in. Yeah, yeah. I want to know what? How much time do we have for questions? Um, we'll go until eight. So you guys can oh, go okay. as long as you want, and then we'll have Q and A for. Great. Right All right, because um, you want to. We want Q Q and A. Right. Because so, I, but I want to close. I want to get you to ex talk this piece out further. Um, did you brought your glasses? Did you bring yeah. your glasses here? I'll have you read it. I'm not going to read your book. You oh, read what am book. I going to read? Um, this underlined asterisk I underlined I love, thing here. See, this is he read this book. <laughs> I love this. So, this is how I read so books. So this this paragraph here. Okay. If diversity is to flower, it cannot be hermetically sealed off from the cultural eco ecosystem in, in which it is implanted. It must be rooted in a mutual understanding of our past and its profound legacy. Viewing America through rose-colored lenses has prevented most white Americans from coming to terms with the myriad ways in which race continues to pervert national ideals and undermine justice. Without truthful encounters with the past, racial reconciliation is doubtful and diversity will remain little more than a hollow abstraction. So if you could give one piece of advice, or maybe two, to a, a business. Let's say Tim Cook called you up and said, hey, you know, Tim. We, we've got some issues. Yeah. What would, what if, and we need to deal with <coughs> fill in the blank diversity issue. What would you advise him? What would you tell him? Here's the one thing you really should do. Other than just like call either Steve Bucarati <laughs> or Cyrus Mary, who mm -hmm. like have created the systems that, that work, I, I would say, well, first, if you're seriously committed, <laughs> stop doing what you've been doing because it doesn't work. And then look at some of the models that have worked. And I mean, it's really that simple. It's just like change course. Mm -hmm. And I think it's probably the hardest thing for major institutions to do, right? Because they, they're rooted in systems and they, they just keep doing it. But I don't know if they would invest billions of dollars in the kind of failure in other realms of, of their business. Like, I, I, I just don't know. Um, it just seems like, you know, like, wouldn't you just say, well, this is not working? Shouldn't heads roll? Like, like, is there accountability? Like, who's doing this? Who's responsible? Where does the, where does the buck stop? And um, if it's Tim Cook, if it stops with him, then like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, like, what, like. Right. I, I remembered what I, oh, what I okay. wanted to bring up. And See, you're no Rick Perry. It, 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 <laughs> so you have all these people. It's a billion dollar business. Right. You have all of these people going into this oh, known yeah. failed business. And a prime example, and prime example not because she's a terrible person, but it sort of exemplifies just how much a demand there is and how easy it is to jump in. April Rain, who <laughs> is the one who coined just in Oscar's one Oscar's so white. Oscar's so white. Mm-hmm. Next thing she knows, and she's not, a, and what I found interesting is that I learned through your book, she's not in Hollywood. She's not, she wasn't involved in a studio. She, she was, was an election lawyer. Yeah. yeah. She was just someone who saw the nominations, did hashtag Oscar so white. Went to work. Went to work. And then all of a sudden <laughs> she's getting called for interviews and things. And she, you caught her saying like she had to bone up on film history and Hollywood in order to do these interviews. And now what is she doing? She's a diversity consultant. <laughs> it's a lot of money in it. And you don't, like, there are people who know what to do because they've done it, like a Steve Bucarati, in a company. Mm -hmm. And then there are people who, you know, opportunity calls. And, and they can just do it. Hang out that shingle. I'm a diversity consultant. And, and I know this is a, this is a, this is a failed business. But is that a is that a bad thing? <laughs> is well, it I a mean, bad? I mean, there well, is, there it, is a need for for diversity. Correct. Not for a multi billion dollar apparatus around diversity. Like imagine that reinforces bad results. imagine if the multi billions were spent 
on getting diversity, hiring people, <laughs> training people. Like, imagine what could happen if that money was directed mm -hmm. in more fruitful ways. Actually, right, and that's actually a point that you make in the book. Um, all that money being spent, you know, why not? push that into actually bring, going to the pipeline that actually does exist right. and bring people in and not just not just hiring people once you hire folks then the next step is how do you support them right and make sure that right and these things some of these things don't cost money it's like mentoring is probably one of the most successful ways to sustain a diverse staff like to to you know ensure the success of the people you've hired you invest in their in their growth like you don't need a major diversity apparatus to mentor people mm -hmm. but anyway or or to just say hey good job yeah you know right um one last question before i throw it up open to q and a and you don't write about any of this in your book i'm just asking because you're here um, you do write about newsroom diversity. And I'm wondering, <clears throat> from your vantage point, or even your own personal opinion, do you think the lack of newsroom diversity is hampering the campaigns of, specifically, Kamala Harris, hmm. Cory Booker? Hmm. And w w was that lack of newsroom diversity something that, in some ways, hindered Hillary Clinton in mm. 2016, but focus on That's an interesting particularly Kamala question. Harris, yeah. because I've been seeing on my Twitter feed over the last few days, especially after her speech at the Iowa dinner, which was terrific, a lot of people wondering, why aren't you covering, why aren't you covering right. her? Why, why are you silencing I mean, black women? It, and, and, it, and it's interesting, you know, because in political reporting, White House, the White House uh, press corps is probably the, one of the least diverse realms in all of American journalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's long been the case. And uh, political reporting has always been, you know, the, considered the, the plum assignment that has eluded many people of color. And of course, it has an impact on how candidates, candidates of color are portrayed how, or if they're covered. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a real knowledge of some of the issues that would um, be important to their base. So, yeah, I mean, but, you know, it's not just journalism. What I found in this book, that all of the fields that are considered the most progressive fields are the least diverse. And, and, and you know, we can think of art museums and, you know, fashion. You know, if you look at the numbers of, like, who's on those boards of the top fashion companies, people of color who almost 40% of the population hold, like, 11% of the board seats. So if you drill down on all of the fields that are considered so progressive, that's where diversity is most acutely mm -hmm. lacking. So, yeah. And you talk about board seats and how there's such a lack of diversity, but such a desire for diversity that there is recycling. Right, of, so uh, they take the same person who's on the Facebook board and then Uber has a problem and then they ask them to be on the Uber board and then another, you know, Starbucks may ask them because they had a little embarrassing episode. And mm -hmm. It's like, that's how it works. As opposed to branching out and seeing who else is out there because there is a pipeline. Right. All right. We're going to go to to a Q&A. Um, there's a microphone here and there's a microphone here. Uh, please, short questions and make sure they're questions. No speeches or I'll cut you off. I apologize in advance. Go ahead. Hi, thank you very much for your really important book. Thank my, you. my question comes from the perspective of academia because that's the space I'm more familiar with. And I, I was wondering if you found, in addition to the whole apparatus of diversity that you're talking about, if if other benefits come to institutions that promote diversity on the one hand, but don't actually really do it. And I'm speaking from, you know, experience of, you know, 
grants that are so much easier to obtain when you claim that you are promoting diversity or people writing papers and people gaining greater visibility and you know what are, what are your thoughts on that part of the business if you will aspect of well, it well that's Thank interesting you. because academia which i've been uh, i've been on the uh, faculty at new york university for 27 years it's one of the least diverse places not just nyu but academia um, African Americans hold four percent of full professors, and that includes at historically black colleges and universities. Latinos are around three percent. The numbers have barely budged in decades, so I don't know who's getting all of these benefits from writing grants, but it's probably not African Americans and Latinos <laughs> who are hardly visible in the academy. I think there's this perception that we're doing so much better than we are because I think those of us who are in academia are hyper visible and it gives people the sense that there are so many of us, which happens with people of color. It's like there's one or two, it's like so many black people. <laughs> it's like so many. But yeah, um, so I, I can't answer that question. I just know that that's one of the the realms of American life that is the least diverse. Question here. <clears throat> this is a question, though it's going to be difficult to phrase it correctly. For those of us, and I'm not saying I'm one of these people, even though I try, but for those of us who recognize the distinction between our individuality and how we are forced to uh, come face to face with how we directly and indirectly um, contribute to the institutional problems and how they contribute to our lives. For those of us who are open-minded enough to recognize it, uh, regardless of race, regardless of class, but don't know how to proceed with that open-mindedness hmm. when we find that... Uh, we have uh, struck a metaphorical wall. Do you have any words of advice? Speak up, stand up, you know? I think, you know, this is a problem that African Americans kind of can't fix. A lot of the issues that I write about, they're not of our making, they're not within our hands to fix, this is a problem that only white Americans, you know, of goodwill can actually address, talking to people in their own. You know, one of the things that, that I found, uh, and not just found in, in researching this book, but what I often um, write about is that most workplaces are a reflection of our social spheres and that we're a deeply segregated nation, particularly our social circles, our churches, our schools. Our, we're just so segregated, right? And so that's why I spend so much time writing about portrayals, because I think for many white Americans, they think they know us based on rap music, based on, you know, how we're depicted in films, how we're depicted, you know, just, you know, any anywhere you look. And... I think it, those of, of, of you who can recognize the inhumanity, the injustice, it, it, I mean, it's up to you to call it out as well. I mean, we should not be alone in this battle because it, we're talking about just justice, which should concern everyone, right? We're talking about American ideals. We're not talking about black rights. We're talking about human rights. We're talking about just what's right. That's what you can, I mean, I think every day we have an opportunity to do something, a little something, you know, you don't have to like march or pro every day. We just have, we, these opportunities arise where we can make a difference just by what we say to someone, how we respond to situations, what we say to our friends and our parents. But don't you think we're going to see uh, more examples of white people thinking they understand it better than they really do? For all I know, I could be one of them. Well, I, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I, I've got, I've got. Thank more. you. Wait, I've got, I've got more for you. So oh. if you haven't, if you haven't read it already, because I don't remember if your hand went up when I asked this question, yeah. but I, I think, don't think it did. White okay. <laughs> yes, Robin, Robin D'Angelo. The name of her book is White yeah. Fragility. Have you read I've it? I've read it. Yes. Oh, you've read it. Yes. So you didn't get. I mean, to me, I mean, if you don't know about White Fragility, it is a book by a white woman to white people about racism. And it is superb. It is. And I thought for sure idea. there would be something in there that would be a, a roadmap and a, a, and a guide for you in answering, in answering your question. But I do think Pamela is right. The number one thing you can do and the number one thing white Americans can do is to just stand up and speak up when you see something that you know in your heart is un unjust especially if what you see happening is happening to a coworker or a neighbor or or even a friend because sometimes for for those of us you know African Americans when those situations happen it is lonely you are at your most vulnerable and all you all you would like is for someone An to an ally yeah right it's mm -hmm. just to say like i'm right here mhm mm or to jump in, like actually, like those people did at that Starbucks in Philadelphia, Precisely. who who you know, recorded their phones, it, they and recorded it, exactly. they were telling the police, right? And African Americans spend so much time just sort of relying on ourselves that we're not even expecting anybody to right. to come in as an ally. But the fact that you even just ask that question, um, and that question is being asked around the country a whole lot more lately over the last three years says to me that as horrible as things uh, are, they're actually, they're actually a little better because I think people are tapping into their inner humanity, mm -hmm. but also how they can help, how they can help their, their, um, their friends, colleagues. Yeah. And voices. I think it has a lot to do with social media that's documented these right. things that people never believed us. Well, right, for generations, <laughs> we've been saying, right. oh, police are killing us, and they're planting evidence and stuff and like that. They're and they're like, oh, no, and you're over-exaggerating. Right. At which you, you point out in the book. So right. thank you, thank for, you that. for that question. You're welcome, and thank you for the answer. Thank you. Question over here. Hi, my name is John Cheeks. I'm the executive director of the United States Adjustment and Recovery Act. Uh, many of you haven't heard of this, but it's a new public policy that's going to be introduced here in the District of Columbia for the injury of slavery. Uh, it goes into economic relief, financial relief. It goes into uh, identifying the actors. Uh, although we're, we're competing against the reparations movement, uh, which I've discovered through different special interest groups, why reparations never got off the ground in this country. Because it, it formed a, a, an allegiance to sue the government and charge the taxpayer. The, Re the Recovery Act does not sue the government and charge the taxpayer. It goes after the industries uh -huh. who were financially, I should say, uh, involved. Ben and benefiting and, from and, and human capital right uh, involved and in, so your your que your question my question is we're at a new era in this country the civil rights era is over the recovery era is in where do you all how would you want to be involved with this new era that's going to bring people together and also uh i explain what reparations is because it, it, in my case it was explained to me why reparations never got off the ground here in this country for us because of certain governments in Africa who were involved in the slave trade we can't charge the United States for reparations we're not from here but we can ask for compensation and that's a lot of confusion going on within our... And, and so you want... What exactly is the question that you want Where answered? would you all... Is it district or federal legislation? It's both. The district is federal. We're not a state. That's the beauty of, that's the beauty of pushing this legislation here in the district. Have you heard of this? No. 
So I, I, I mean, I, and well, right. So, um, but thank you for bringing that to our attention. I've not heard of this, so I can't even comment on on the legislation that you're talking about. I guess about. first we have to do some research, huh? Well, right. Well, the <laughs> right. question is, if you had a choice, which which one would you well, take? Well, I mean, you're asking, yeah. recovery. I mean, this is like the debate where they ask you, <laughs> so do you want Medicare for all or do right. you want to get rid of all insurance? And you put your hand up and then all hell breaks loose. And then your head gets chopped <laughs> off. <laughs> right, right. But thank you. Dr. Cornell West supports okay. um, the, this legislation. Cool. Question here. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your book. Um, Thank you. I wonder wonder if you ha I, I did a quick look at the index, and you don't mention <clears throat> foundations. And I wonder if you had a chance to look at. I actually, mentioned the foundations, role of foundations in the in the first chapter. Oh, well, not, <laughs> not in the index then. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the Ford Foundation, which should be, uh, um, then our indexer didn't do his job <laughs> <In> <laughs> or her job. In but two thousand eight, yeah. Gerald Lamarche, when he was Atlantic Philanthropy CEO. Mm -hmm. gave a wonderful speech in Georgetown talking about race as a philanthropic imperative. And he right. he did a remarkable job in sort of calling out diversity as this bland euphemism. Right. Well, yeah, one of the people, um, in fact, we both know, uh, Darren Walker, sure. the president of the Ford Foundation, who I had the opportunity to interview for this book. Um, he was, in fact, was one of the first people I went to because he has um, committed – you know, their millions of dollars um, towards projects that promote equality. So, yeah, no, yeah, foundations so, so are... So in addition to Ford, maybe Kellogg, are there... Do you think that, that this whole notion of... Uh, uh, the foundation's been essentially duped by the diversity consulting industry and funding a lot of stuff that in reality is tokenism and really not, a, not getting at the heart of the problem? Well, that's probably... That can be said for just about every institution. <laughs> so that's that's what I'm writing about. Um, and, and, you know, even the well-meaning ones are probably doing um, some of that. Uh, so uh, I don't know what your question is. Yeah, I, well, I've, it's, I've been away from chasing money for a while. So I, wonder if, I was wondering if things are getting any better. But I also want to thank you for, I, I also saw in the index that you're, you, you've written a bit about uh, the role of Asian Americans oh, definitely. In, in this diversity yes. industry. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, well, I mean, of course, because now we have crazy rich Asians we're all taken care of, right? <laughs> That's, that image is all straight now. Right, but right. No, I, I write about the history of discrimination against Asians as well. You know, everyone wants to um, look at Asians as taking care of model minority, yep. you know, check a box, but Asians in this country have had their their own set of struggles and are also implicated in this whole diversity yeah. debate. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Question here. Hi. Um, I recently learned of anti-racism coaches, um, whereby a beleaguered manager or executive who has either proven themselves incapable of respecting or retaining people of color on their staff um, will pay a basically one-on-one -on -one consultant. Um, yes, anti-bias training. Right, to help them do that. Mm -hmm. um, in your estimation and with the industry as a whole, the people who are, are paying for these services, do they believe they're going to work because they have that sort of naive view that racism is something that's going to be cured? I, or? I'm not a psychologist, mm -hmm. psychiatrist. I have put no one on a couch. All I could do is look at how this money is being expended and how it doesn't work. And that's one of the things that is typically done by a lot of institutions, anti-bias training, and there's no indication that it works. And in fact, some studies indicate that it makes matters worse. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Question here? Yes, hi, thank you so much. Hi. Can I, can yeah. everybody hear me? I don't know. Yes. Um, thank you so much for lean, coming this evening. Lean in. Lean in. Lean, lean in. Lean in. Lean. Am I, can I <laughs> yeah, get yeah. heard now? Now, okay. we, can, now yeah. we can hear you. Okay, perfect. You're good. Um, just very quick anecdote. I um, worked in academia um, in the engineering um, field, and I was an engineer for a while and went back to my alma mater, and um, my director of the diversity of engineering that I worked with, um, she was at Cal Berkeley during the time of... 
Yep. <laughs> well, go UVA is where I went to. Okay. <laughs> and there's a thing there. Um, point is, uh, she was at Berkeley during Prop 209. And then out of 209, um, she ended up coming to the University of Virginia. And we were seeing the numbers kind of being decimated, right. especially in um, black, specifically black oh, and Latinx um, enrollment Precisely. in engineering in California. Mm -hmm. And it has never recovered. Engineering, engineering law, yes. a, a number of fields. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at it now, I shouldn't say look at it now, my, my, the main question is for diversity's sake, a lot of programs were in in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in order to get people into jobs, affirmative action, of course. A lot of that got dismantled in this diversity coaching inclusion became the buzzword and people were doing that versus doing the actual hiring right. and getting people in. Are, are people afraid of those affirmative action lawsuits that might come about? Why has of it course. reversed? I mean, yeah, it's like I yeah. just... Well, he, he, he yeah. read a part from um, Lee Bollinger, the president of Columbia University, who mm -hmm. said just that, that people are afraid of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And the needle won't move forward right. in tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, because there's a lot of people, kind of like what you're saying with the April Rain person. There's a lot of people who are doing diversity but you know, inclusion but you in know, tech. Who but but in tech. tech, the thing that's so interesting, I recently read a, read an article. You know, Google had spent Google alone spends like more than a hundred million a year on diversity initiatives, mm -hmm. and for blacks, it's like two to two percent in tech and three percent overall. And there there is a tech company, and the the name is escaping me that they just change course and instead of focusing on like three or four schools for their recruitment efforts, they broaden the field mm -hmm. and voila, they tripled the number, number of people. like in, in a really, really short time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the whole pipeline thing, mm -hmm. it's not, it's just not true. Correct. Right. Yeah. But people thank you. You're, yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Now you were talking before about, um, oh, are you going to, you have a question, sir? Oh, no, go. Make a comment. No, no, no. No, oh. no oh, please. I was just in line. Ask your question. <laughs> Ask your question, and then I'll I, I, bring I'm up sorry. my coach. So I was, um, <laughs> I'll lean in. So uh, I was just up at the University of Pennsylvania. They had a one day environmental justice conference, and the first few panels were almost exclusively all white academics talking about environmental justice. Right. And it seemed to me like it was a branding opportunity for the University of Pennsylvania to put out their big plan to deal with environmental justice issues nationally and get in front of what is, I think for them, a buzz phrase. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering how reflective of, I mean, you were talking about the percentages of uh, people of color in academia, how reflective that is of the type of colonization that gets done of uh, places where they think they can go, you know, make money and make a name or brand their school. Well, it's an example of what I'm what I'm I'm talking about that the most progressive fields, environmental justice, there it's not diverse. Like they, there's it's it's almost like I think the more progressive, it's like we have it covered. Mm -hmm. Like we don't need like diversity cuz we're progressive. We can do it. And uh, um, yeah, it's it, that's typical though. I, I mean, I've been to so many conferences over the past two and a half half decades of being in academia, where they're talking about the future of news or the future of the environment or the future, and it's like all white people talking about the future. Meanwhile, the demographics <laughs> are, sh are showing that the future doesn't look like those panels. Uh, the can I do an add-on? Sure. It's up okay. to Jonathan. I'm just asking. <laughs> sure. I, I don't want to sure, violate sure. any rules. Um, so uh, at, at this conference, they brought in a person who is uh, the so-called hero of Flint and D.C. and the lead and water crisis, a professor from Virginia Tech, who uh, has won huge numbers of grants and awards, half-million-dollar awards, million-dollar awards, you know, things like that. And uh, they – they gave him their imprimatur of the environmental justice guy, but 60 residents from Flint wrote an open letter to the science and engineering community saying, your engagement really didn't work for us. Where is there a place in the United States to lodge a complaint? And where is there a place to have an independent investigation of the type of engagement that's going on? And 
I feel like there's sort of uh, people stealing narratives and voices and claiming to save uh, communities of color and then reaping all of these benefits and making their career work. And I wonder also if this is, I mean, I know it's not specifically the diversity training piece that you're looking at, but it's just something that I see in the work that we do with communities around the country that this is going on everywhere. Well, I think any we should always be wary when people are spokespeople for people who are invisible. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like there, you know, the, we we should always be just a little wary. Like you're speaking for them, but where are they? Right. And do they get to have a platform as well? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm try- I've I've read so. Like I said, I in 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 order, white fragility, and then I picked white up white rage. rage, and then I pick up diversity Inc. So I can't remember if you wrote this <laughs> or if um, Carol Anderson and White Rage wrote this, but about going to going to an event. Where that was me. That was you going to an event, and you're the only one, right? Or uh, and one or two. yeah. And what was so weird about that one because it happens all the time, all the, and yeah. this is New York City, you know, right. New, uh, New York, New York City. City, the most diverse city in the world, right? And um, so I was at a lecture given by a very noted chronicler of the civil rights movement, and. After the lecture, the president of this university that shall remain nameless invited um, about 50 people to a private dinner with the guest of honor. And I'm I'm sitting there, and I'm the only African-American, only person of color, except for the wait staff surrounding the room with their uniforms and trays. And I said, they don't even get the irony (laughs) that this looked like a scene out of you know, what he had just recounted covering the civil rights movement, covering the segregated South, except this was like 2018, 2017. And the irony was lost on my table guests. I said, look at this. And they were like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so, I mean, I think many of us um, professionals have been in that same situation. Well, not to put the African Americans on the spot in the, in the room, but <laughs> just in the last 30 days, <laughs> have you been at an event where you were the only one in the room or you could count the number of us on one or two hands? Yes, and, and okay, all people of color. <laughs> well, it happens, yeah. A right, lot. and in twenty, when I was starting my career, and I, you know, I was like, oh, I'm just this young, I'm this young kid. I'm looking around the room, it's like, well, I'm okay. I'm the only one, <laughs> but things are going to get better. Things, you know, it's it's going to, and here we are at twenty nineteen, and I'm still walking into rooms, looking around, right, and seeing I'm the only one, right, in the, diverse cities, in cities where there are. There is a sizable number of people of color. The, sil- the silver lining in, in this sort of sad um, story is that now when my husband goes to events and he's you know white redhead from North Dakota, <laughs> he goes to events and he will come home and say, I'm tired of going to these you know non-diverse events. There were no people of color, or there was one person of color. So I take that as a as a sign you know, of a progress. Si- a sign yeah. of progress. Tiny. Yeah. But you sign know, but the, but 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 just just before we close, mm-hmm. that is what I'm talking about. It's it, you know, it's okay. People should socialize with whomever they want to, but that is perpetuating these these exclusionary workplaces because. That's who you recommend for a job. That's who your friend, you know, your friends will recommend. So that that's the it, the problem is not that people are not choosing to socialize across the 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 racial lines. The problem is that it perpetuates inequality and injustice in segregated workplaces. And this is the perfect paragraph to to end on and it's early in the book i'm not going to tell you the page because i need you to buy the book (laughs) so you can see it but you write unless and until white america including those who claim progressive values comes to terms with its complicity and persisting injustice diversity initiatives will continually fail pamela newkirk thank you very much for being here thank you oh my god thank you so much